Tonight, we're going to be looking, like I said, at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. In a message I'm entitling, Walk Carefully. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, like Carolyn prayed, for our Savior. That, Lord, in Jesus, we have a Savior. We have hope. Lord, even as we sang that classic Christmas hymn, Lord, I couldn't help but think of that, the line that, that says, the thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. And also, Lord, the passage that says that the soul felt its worth, that Jesus helps us understand just how valuable we are. Lord, if something is valuable in direct proportion to what is willing to be paid, Lord, we know that Jesus paid it all. And Lord, we know that sometimes we live in a world-crushing circumstance where we think that God is punishing us and we sometimes forget that everyone suffers sometimes. And that, Lord, you allow setbacks and suffering to make us more mature. Lord, we know that sometimes we believe the lie that you could never use us ever again. But, Lord, we know that Satan loves to tell us lies because he wants us to give up. And, Lord, we remember that he comes to rob and kill and destroy. But, Lord, we're so grateful that for those of us who are willing to come to you and submit to you and confess to you our sin, that you're willing to forgive us. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray for that person who has for whatever reason believed the lie that they'll never be happy again. That hope is gone. Lord, I pray that you would remind them that there is joy and peace and hope that's still available in Christ. And so again, Lord, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 15, Paul writes, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In this chapter, Paul has exhorted the Ephesians to walk in love at the beginning of the, of the chapter in verses 1 through 6. We're to walk in the light in verses 7 through 14. And now Paul cautions the Ephesians to walk carefully in verses 15 through 17. In the previous chapter, you'll remember that Paul told the believers, look, I need you to avoid living an immoral lifestyle and adopt a spiritual lifestyle. Remember, we're to put off the old person and we're to put on the new person. And so there are certain things that aren't supposed to characterize our life anymore, like lying in chapter 4, verse 24, uncontrolled anger in verses 26 through 27, stealing in verse 28a, corrupt desires, 29a, grieving the Holy Spirit, chapter chapter 4, verse 30. And so instead, we're supposed to exercise truthfulness in verse 25, honest labor in verse 28, helping people in need, verse 28, building up one another in verse 29, exercising kindness and compassion in verse 32, exercising forgiveness in verse 32. We Follow Jesus in love, chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. We avoid immorality, verse 3. We refrain from corrupt communication, verses 4 and 5. We make every effort 
to not allow people to deceive us, verse 6 and 7. We walk in the light, verse 8, 9, 11, 14. We seek God's will and then we do it, verse 10. And later in verse 17, we use the opportunities that God has entrusted to us to do what is good in verses 15 and 16. And that's quite a list. Can you imagine just for a moment that you don't know anything about the Bible at all? Except for chapter 4 and chapter 5. That all you knew, all you knew about what it meant to be a Christian and how to act and how to live is only in those two chapters. Can you imagine if you just devoted the rest of your life to just simply doing that? You would have your hands full. Five times in chapter 4 and 5, five times Paul writes, Walk worthy of the calling, chapter 4, verse 1. No longer walk like the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, chapter 4, verse 17. Walk in love, chapter 5, verse 1. Walk as children of the light, verse 8. Walk circumspectly, verse 15. We walk carefully in the world. And remember what the Bible means when it's talking about walk. It's a description of how we conduct ourselves in the very real world in which we live. We consider the time, verse 15. We consider the days, verse 16. We consider the truth, verse 17. And so, by the way, in the next seven verses, Paul is going to contrast and compare foolish steps and careful conduct. Our focus is only going to be on these three small verses. And so we walk as children of the light. What does that mean? We walk as God's children in light of the high calling that God has called us to. And what is that? We've been called by God to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to walk with him. So again, to walk as fools means to descend from this lofty calling and then walk like mere men and women and conduct ourselves like everybody else around us. And so what Paul says is consider the time. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise in verse 15. What does that mean? We don't use words like that anymore. Walk circumspectly. The Greek word is akribos. It means to walk with precision. It, it means to walk in an exact way or a careful way. Thayer says accurately, diligently. Vine says the word expresses accuracy, which has the outcome of being careful. The adverb appear, appears five times in the New Testament, where twice is translated diligently in Matthew 2.8 and Acts 18.25. So the word basically means carefully, but it means way more than that. Years ago, I was at a conference in South America in Colombia, and at this Colombian conference, I had the opportunity to go into the Amazon basin, and the, this is where the Amazon river flows, and there's a deep, deep trench, and there was a high cliff, and we were going to go into the Amazon, and we were going to hunt cocodrilo, means crocodiles, in the middle of the night. So it's pitch black in the Amazon jungle, and we're looking for crocodiles. And we were told to pay close attention to where we were walking. So I have this flashlight. And, and the guy who is my guide, his name is Lucho. Which he says, don't take the flashlight off the ground. <laughs> so I'm supposed to shine the light on the ground and then walk carefully, step by step by step. But for whatever reason, I get distracted and I shine the light straight ahead and my next step is off the cliff. I literally 
walk off the cliff. Now, I was much younger then, and my cat-like reflexes kicked in. No, it was desperation and adrenaline. I literally twisted, and I held on to a branch. I mean, I disappeared from sight. I was gone. And they go, Gino, donde estas? Our Spanish-speaking friends know what that means. Where are you? And I said, Lucho, ayúdame. That means help me, help me. And so they come and they think that I'm joking. They think that this is some sort of prank. I'm holding on to a branch, getting ready to fall to my death. And they're laughing. And they've already caught one of the little baby alligators and they've wrapped its mouth. And Lucho leans over and he says, Bese el cocodrilo. She laughs because she understands what it means. It means you're going to have to kiss the crocodile. <laughs> and so here's this reptile, no lips, all teeth. He presses its face to my face, and I go. <laughs> you know what I'm ashamed to admit to you? It's not the ugliest thing I've ever kissed. <laughs> they pulled me up and laughed and laughed and laughed. That's what it means. Carefully, diligently. There's a reason why he's using this as, as an example. There, there was another example. And if you go to Mexico and other parts of Central and South America and even the Middle East, you'll see walls. And on the top of those walls, they'll have glass that's cut and embedded in the wall. Some of you have seen it. And I remember seeing a cat walking carefully, placing its paw in between the razors and the glass as it makes its way across the wall. And that's the idea that you are to step carefully, purposely, specifically. And we're not to walk as fools, it says, but as wise. Paul is, is using a play on words in the Greek language. It's not as asaphoi. We get the word sophisticated, which means, or sophist, it means wise. Asaphoi, you put an A in the front, it makes it negative. And so he's basically saying, not as unwise, but Wise, the word translated fools here is unwise. And so here, fool doesn't mean stupid idiot. It doesn't mean a person who doesn't who's who who isn't thoughtful or or even careful, but but the idea is that you are thoughtless and you are careless. And so the unwise person is the person who's not willing to think about their life the path that they're on, the direction that they're following. The unwise person is the person who gives little thought to their life and, and even less to their future. And so the Bible repeatedly uses this metaphor of walking to describe the journey, the journey that you and I call life. Smart people are capable of making bad decisions. The psalmist in Psalm 101 verse 2, who in this case happens to be David, says, quote, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. When David says that in Psalm 101, he's, he's making a vow to live a holy life, to live a life that's separated. And so the walk that David describes as he's, as he's singing and he's crying out to the Lord, he understands that this, this mentality begins in the home. You don't have a life at church and then a life at home. The life that you live at home and the, the life that you live here and the life that you live out there has to be consistent. And so we walk wisely in our home. At the beginning of Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2, we were told walk wisely in the church. Now we're told, walk wisely in the world or circumspectly or carefully. We pay attention. We watch every step. Why? 
Because you're in danger. Just like when I took my eye off the path just for a split second, it only took one wrong step to put my life in danger. And from a spiritual standpoint, the same is true. You don't have to step very far away from Jesus to get into trouble. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have fun. We can have fun. But part of the Christian walk implies something that most of us have a tough time embracing, and that's discipline. Discipline means the careful commitment to walk in a specific way in order to have an appropriate outcome. If you want to be a musician, you're going to have to practice. If you're going to be, a, to be an artist, you're going to have to draw. There are certain things. If you're going to be an athlete, you have to do what is going to be necessary in order for you to perform. And so when Paul, writing to the Ephesians, says, I need you to walk carefully and I need you to walk in wisdom... And not as unwise. Note what he says in verse 16. That we're to consider the days. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. How do we walk carefully and thoughtfully? Paul is going to give us a suggestion in the very next verse. One way is to redeem the time. The expression redeeming the time is a single Greek verb. Exa. Agorizo. Exa means out of. Agorizo is the marketplace. It literally was an idea of out of the marketplace or, or the place where the goods and the services are bought and sold and exchanged. And so it came to mean to purchase or to conduct a transaction or to literally take something off the market so that it no longer becomes available. And so in a very real sense, the idea of a slave being purchased from the marketplace means it's no longer available. And what's interesting in the original language, in the middle voice, the idea is to purchase oneself with the idea that you are removing yourself from the market, leaving you with the impression that you're to make the most of the time that you have left. And so here, it's not simply the amount of time, or the, but the quality of time. Paul is using the expression redeeming the time in the sense of seizing every opportunity or purchasing back failed opportunity or buying back missed opportunity. We don't buy time. We've been given time as a gift by God. We as human beings exchange our time for things of value. Some of you work. Most of you work. You exchange your time for remuneration or for monetization. You exchange your time for what you think is valuable. Some of you are fortunate and you get to use your time loving your grandchildren or loving your children or, or caring for people or praying for people. Whatever it is that you do and however it is that you do it, your time reflects what you consider to be valuable. So what does that mean? What does it mean to redeem the time? It means to use your time wisely. We can live our lives as an expression of love for Jesus Christ. We can witness for the Lord. We can work faithfully for the Lord. We can celebrate righteousness. We can mourn sin because many of us, me, spent some of our life wasting our life. But what God is basically saying is, I've bought you. I've redeemed you. And every moment that you have left, you have a choice of what you're going to do with it, the time. Let me put it in a different way. Have you ever had the opportunity to do what was right? 
and you didn't. Paul is saying, there's still time. You can still make up for missed opportunities. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make up for every single opportunity, but there is an opportunity, and it exists right at this very moment. And I even love that word, opportunity. You, may, you probably know I have a fascination with words and the meaning of the word and the root of the word. Think about that word just for a moment, opportunity. It comes from a Latin word, which means towards the port or to sail towards the port. Those of you who grew up around water, whether you know, you're in the Mediterranean or the Atlantic or the Pacific or wherever you happen to be, it, it, meant, it meant to head for the harbor. It meant to go for the shore. It meant to go to that place where you could be on solid ground. And so it came to mean the idea of carrying a ship and all of its goods into a safe harbor because the wind is blowing in the right direction. That's where we get that word. It's the idea that the winds are favorable. The port is beautiful. You can go to the place where you can be secure and safe. Life is short. And so we walk in love because Jesus has invited us to walk in love. Ephesians 5, 2. We walk in the truth. 3 John uh, verse 3. We walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16. We walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We walk in the newness of life. Romans 6, 4. We walk honestly. Romans 13, 13. We walk worthy of the Lord with all pleasing. It says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 10, the idea being God is looking, God is watching, and he's pleased with the choice that you made, the choice to pray, the choice to read your Bible, the choice to help, the choice to worship, the choice to serve. And Paul makes mention that the days are evil. It's the Greek word poneros. That word is a word that seems to imply something that started off good that became corrupt. It would be a word that you would use to describe fruit that's gone bad or something that's been left in your refrigerator for six months. In other words, it may have started its life off as something edible, but it's now become something miserable, disgusting, maybe even harmful. That's the idea, because the days are poneros. You know, when the Bible says in Genesis, it says in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, it says he created it and he found that it was good. He separated the darkness from the light. The darkness he called night, the the light he called day, remember? And he, and he found that it was good. And he creates this world with living animals and all kinds of wonderful things. And he saw that it was good. The world then went horribly and terribly bad. We live in a world that offers a sort of smorgasbord of dainties. And so all of a sudden, all of those things that were meant to be good, all of a sudden became poneros. Is it wrong to eat? No, but can you eat in such a way that you dishonor God? That's yeah, called gluttony. Is it wrong to drink? No, it's not but you can drink in such a way that you dishonor God. And he's going to talk about that in the very next verse, in verse 18, when he says, don't be drunk with wine, wherein is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You can take something that is perfectly good and make it perfectly bad. The Christian faces a constant battle in this world. In 1 John 2, 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, sensuality, the lust of the eyes, materialism, the pride of life, egotism. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. Let me ask you another question. Do you think our days are less evil than Paul's day? Probably not. 
Paul had some real difficult situations going on in Ephesians. If you turn all the way back to the beginning of the book, when he says, Paul, the apostle, to the saints who were in Ephesus, he's writing this about 60 AD. What's happening in 60 AD? Nero is the emperor of the Roman Empire. By 66, the Jewish People are going to revolt against Rome. By 70, the temple is going to be destroyed and the Jews are going to be dispersed. From the time of 60, when he's writing this, to about 66, Paul, the author of this book, is going to have his head chopped off. And the Christians are going to be persecuted in severe ways. In Paul's day, Christians faced great difficulty and constant persecution. It shouldn't come as a shock and as a surprise to you that in a world that is increasingly hostile to the Bible, to the gospel, to what it says and what it means is going to be increasingly hostile to you. Jesus actually said that. He said, don't be concerned when people hate you. Remember, they hated me first. Don't be concerned when you get persecuted. They persecuted me first. The Christian is going to face difficulty. And I think Paul is making to the evil that confronts the believer day by day. And so as we think about that for just a moment, even as he's writing to the Ephesians, and he basically says to them, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He's talking about the specific confrontation that comes moment by moment as you are invited to give up, to give in, to fall down. You're going to be constantly invited to believe lies. To walk away. You're going to be invited to spend your time selfishly and foolishly. So evil here can, can range from a mild distraction to severe temptation to even profound persecution. But all of these things are meant to steer you away from the walk that God has called you to. So our task is to redeem the time, to cherish the opportunity, to make the most of what God has given to us. Here's the idea. Because the opportunity will pass because the days are evil. So when Paul wrote these words, again, the Roman Empire is going to embark on a deliberate and a specific and a persistent campaign of persecution. So one day, the opportunity to speak is going to come to an end. One day, the opportunity to give is going to end. One day, the opportunity to serve is going to end. One day, the opportunity to love is going to pass away. The opportunity to pray is going to pass us by. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29, when Paul's writing to the Corinthians earlier, he says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. Those who use this world is not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. Paul, in speaking to these Corinthians, isn't inviting men to abandon their wives or women to leave their husbands or to or to just pretend you're not living in the world. Paul is, isn't saying that in times of distress, we give up and we give up on everything. The time and the testing, what Paul is saying in that particular instance, should cause us to pause and give full consideration to what's going on in our life. As you look around you, you make a judgment about what is going to be the best way to live your life. I think part of it, meaning you live with a sense of urgency. In what way? Because the opportunity is passing us. We live lives, Paul says, 
that should be noted for its holiness, marked by mercy with words of help. And so he's giving us a framework in which to live our lives. So if we're going to live in holiness, if we're going to be marked by mercy, if we're going to speak words that are encouraging, then guess what? All of a sudden we have to go, I need to think about where I am, what I'm doing, what I'm saying. And so he says, consider the truth in verse 17. Look what it says. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's connect the dots again. How can we walk carefully and thoughtfully, like it says in verse 15? We redeem the time. We consider the days. We understand the climate and the times in which we're living in verse 16. And then we understand what the will of the Lord is. Now let's pay attention, first of all, to Paul's warning. Look what it says at the beginning. Therefore, do not be unwise. Different word, affron. What does that mean? It could be translated, do not be senseless. That word fron is the idea of thoughtful. We get the word phrenesis from it, uh, or phrenetic. The, the idea is thoughtless or senseless. The contrast, of course, is with what makes sense. Let's put it that way. There are things that make sense. There are things that are nonsense. I think that that's part of what I would say. So the contrast is what makes the most sense. So Paul is going to contrast that with the will of the Lord. It makes sense to do what God wants. So, when are we most likely to be unwise? We're most likely to be unwise when we begin to think about the world's definition of what constitutes sensible. So I want you to think about that for just a moment. Human philosophy pretends that we can think our way out of the human condition. I'm not down on thinking. This is not what I'm saying. What I'm suggesting to you is for the person who says, I can think my way out of this problem. There are certain things that we can think our way out of it. But one of the things we can't think our way out of is the problem of sin in our life. And the sin that pollutes us and corrupts us. And the only way out of that is going to be through the Lord Jesus. And so human philosophy pretends that we can think our way out of the human condition. Indulgence says we can drink our way out. Science says we can invent our way out. And industry says that we can work our way out. Government says we can spend our way out. The world says you can entertain your way out. But Jesus is basically saying, I'm the way out. I am going to provide you with the best solution to the problems and the challenges that, that we face. So who is the wise person? This is the person who understands the will of the Lord. Who is the unwise person? This is the person who fails to understand the will of the Lord. That makes sense to you, doesn't it? The wise person understands, well, what does God want? The unwise person says, what do you think? What do you want? What does the world say I need? What does this particular group or that particular group say that I need? The person who fails to understand the will of the Lord is the unwise person. You'll remember, I'm thinking about Christmas already. At the birth of Jesus, the wise man at least one of them presented him with frankincense. The worldly wise present us with nonsense. <laughs> and so, 
I want to draw your attention to that word, understand. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand. Sunni, my. That word understand means to grasp. It means to lay hold of. So this word understand is is an idiomatic expression, which we might translate I want you to lay hold of this. I want you to take it and grasp it. Who is the unwise person? Again, it means to lay hold of, but it means to lay hold of or perceive with the mind. The days are full of evil, so the believer wants to grasp the truth, consider the truth, lay hold of the truth. And so the idea is you grasp or lay hold of or hold on to or grab what the Bible is saying about any given situation. We want to know, understand God's will, so that we can conf- confront evil. Why do we want to confront evil? Poneros or evil or that which is corrupt. We confront it in order to defeat it in our lives. To defeat it. If we don't understand God's will, we run the risk of acting in an unwise or foolish or senseless fashion. Now, many of us have spent literally thousands of hours, tens of thousands of dollars drinking at the well of human understanding. We buy books. We watch TED Talks. We will go anywhere and do anything in order to get the information that we think that we need in order to help us in our fallen or broken or confused condition. But we neglect the source of of knowledge, which is revealed in the will of God. And how do we know the will of God? It's found in the word of God. And so knowing God's word requires careful, deliberate, disciplined, study, and so all of a sudden when you go, well, why, why, why do you teach the Bible so much? See, you laugh, but you understand, huh? Where else are you going to discover God's will, God's principle, God's understanding? Well, why would you spend so much time in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy? I spent a year teaching the entire book of Isaiah, another year teaching the entire book of Jeremiah. That's two years. And you know what the theme of both of those books are? Judgment. I practically killed our church. I mean, how many ways can you say, please repent because God's judgment is coming? In Jeremiah, there's 52 chapters. I had to figure out 52 different ways to say, well, you know, judgment um, is a problem. And if we refuse to obey God, then we might be in trouble. And it becomes very, very difficult But there are people who will devote their lives to understanding almost anything other than what the Bible says and what the Bible means and what the Bible provides. So what is the will of God for our lives? Well, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's basically, when he says, and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the more we're transformed by the power of Christ, the less we will be conformed to what the world is saying. So the will of God for the Christian begins at the altar. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a holy and a living sacrifice. The altar, by the way, is that place of personal dedication. You'll remember in the Old Testament, the altar is the place where you burn the sacrifice. In the New Testament, I'm not inviting you to burn yourself up or kill yourself, but rather you present yourself. The idea is to surrender. And so, you begin a different kind of a life. Not one of quaint acquaintance, but you begin to live your life like the gospel's true. And what Jesus says is true. And our motive is love. Paul doesn't say, I command you, therefore, brethren. He doesn't say, I command you. He says, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging with you and I'm pleading with you because the motive is love. We don't serve Jesus in order to secure his mercies, but rather because his mercies have already been made available to us. We present our mind. We present our body. We present our will. We yield our bodies filled with the spirit. We submit our minds renewed by the word. We surrender our will. How? Is it just where you make this purpose? You go, I am going to purpose in my heart that instead of obeying the flesh and obeying the devil and obeying the world, I'm going to obey God. It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. The only way that you're going to be able to surrender is to test, prove, and yield and to pray, and to obey. You see, again, remember what the book of Ephesians has constantly reminded us, that when we put off one thing, we have to put on a new thing. So the writer of Ephesians says, stop lying, start telling the truth. Stop stealing, start working. Stop saying, I'm going to do better. Pray. Pray. Yield, submit, obey. In our world, we're given options. Many of you know that my wife was in a horrible car accident. Maybe you don't know. Miss Mindy came and rescued her, but this, she was on the side and she got hit and her rear end kind of got crumpled and the other person's car was totaled and my poor wife's car was totaled. And so we had to get her a new car. And because we had to get her a new car, the, the car said, there's good, there's better, and there's best. That's a great sales technique, isn't it? We've got, here's what you have to choose from, good, better, or best. And I said, I'll, I'll take good. <laughs> We have a good model. We have a better model. We have the best model. Some people obey God because they're afraid of him. I'm going to obey God because I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to obey God because I know what sin can do to me. Some people obey God because they're terrified. Some people obey God because they know it's good for them. But some people obey God out of a deep devotion that comes from saying, I know that God loves me. And if I, can, if I can know God's will and love God's will, if I can love him and then love what he loves, I can experience the deepest satisfaction. And so for the Christian, there's good and there's better and there's best. For the, for the Christian, he says, I'm going to obey God because, hey, I don't want to get in trouble. Good for you. I want to obey God because I know that obedience is better than disobedience. Good for you. 
I want to obey God and I desperately want to know his will and I want to find satisfaction in his will. In choosing between a car, I might have to go with good instead of better when I really wish I could get best. But when it comes to a right relationship with God, if you're choosing between good, better, and best, best doesn't cost you any more than good or better. And it's going to give you a deeper sense of satisfaction. So how can we be wise and understand God's will? It it was Thomas Aquinas who said, a man's heart is right when he wills what God wills. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter writes, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some has counted slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, to repentance. The idea is we know that it's God's will that people repent of their sin. We know that it's God's will that people come to know and love the Savior. And so for that person who's wondering, I wonder if God wants me to be saved. The answer is... Yes. He wants you to be saved. He wants the darkness and the pain and the problems and the difficulty to be answered in your life. And what is God's will? Guess what? We don't have to look any further than the Bible. And again, like I said earlier, if we confined ourselves exclusively to chapter 5, though you don't have to, If you go, okay, I want to know what God's will is. Just look at chapter 5. It's God's will that you follow Jesus in love, verses 1 and 2. Avoid immorality in verse 3. Abandon obscene language in verses 4 and 5. Refuse to be deceived by false teachers and false doctrine in verses 6 and 7. Walk in the light, verse 8, verses 11 through 14. Seek God's will and then do it, verse 10 and then in verse 17. Use every opportunity to do good, verses 15 and 16. Later you're going to discover, don't get drunk on wine or anything else in verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit in verse 18. Exercise gratitude in verse 20. Submit to one another, verse 21. You mean that's it? No, there's a whole lot more. But if you only did those things, guess what? Your life would improve a thousand million billion percent. We walk in love and light. And so here's what Paul's saying. I want to give you new love, light, spiritual eyesight, insight. We walk knowing that God is sovereign. We know that God is sovereign and has a moral will. We walk knowing God's sovereign will and moral will is found in his heart of love. In other words, what is the will of God? Here's where you go. You go, where can I find the will of God? In the word of God. And what will you find in the word of God? The heart of God. And what will you find in the heart of God? of God that he knows what's best it's reflected by God's desires he's not willing that any should perish he wants you to be saved he wants you to be sanctified it's God who works in you not it's God who works in you to will and to work according to his good purposes it says in Philippians 2.13 it sounds cliche But the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Where does God want me to go? Wherever that is and whatever it is, he'll give you what you need to be there. Bernard Edinger put it this way, quote, Inside the will of God, there is no failure. Outside the will of God, there is no success. In other words, you will find the place of greatest joy and greatest revelation when you find yourself 
where the heart of God is. We live in a world where there's an abundance of evil and a shortness of time and feverish activity. That's why it's really important to find out what the will of God is for you today. And the simplest thing is, if you don't have a right relationship with God, it's God's will that you have a right relationship. If you've never experienced the forgiveness of sin, it's God's will for you to experience the forgiveness of sin. If, if you don't know what it's like to walk in the Spirit, it's God's will for you to know what it's like to walk in the Spirit. If you've never really spent a lot of time on the path of wisdom, it's okay for you to find that path and then to walk carefully, clearly, and prayerfully. You can find his will and follow his will and then forget foolishness. And what's the biggest problem? Lies. God's punishing me. No. Truth is everyone suffers sometimes. God sometimes allows problems so that we will love him and trust him and grow and strengthen and mature. Well, God can't use me. I've just done too many really wrong things. No, Satan loves to tell us that lie because he wants you to give up. I talked about this on Sunday, remember? People are tempted to give up and Jesus says, get up. And go and find the resurrected Savior. My favorite lie God's fed up with me. It sounds so believable. But God isn't a human being, He doesn't hold a grudge, He's different from you. You see, you can be fed up with each other. Fed up with your husband, fed up with your wife, fed up with your children. You, if you're fed up with your grandchildren, there's something really wrong with you, and I need to see you after the service. But sometimes we do get fed up. But God's love is everlasting, His grace is overwhelming. His willingness to lift you up is amazing. And so, if you think that you could never be happy, if you think that your hope is gone and your joy is gone and your peace is gone, God can give you the power to embrace the plan of God and the will of God, which is revealed in the word of God. We're going to have communion in just a moment. And again, I'm reminded in Philippians 1, 6, where it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to the completeness until the day of Christ Jesus. God's begun the work. He'll continue the work. He will finish the work. This is why we walk carefully, not foolishly. We're going to have communion. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to have Carolyn come up. We're going to sing a song. Heavenly Father, we... Again, think about the sacrifice of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus died and bled so that our sin could be forgiven and was raised from the dead, Lord, so that we could experience life and hope and joy and peace. And so, Lord when we consider the abundance of evil in the world and the shortness of time, it makes perfect sense that we would want to know your will. And Lord, you said that it's your will. 
for us to walk in the light and to walk carefully and to find out what your will is and to do it. And so again, Lord, for that person who's struggling and terrified and fed up, Lord, I pray that your heart of love would be revealed to them. Lord, I pray that as we consider the sacrifice of Jesus, that, Lord, we would know that we would find a place clearly in the center of your heart of love. The Bible says you were willing not just to give your son, and having given your son, what, what in the world would you withhold from us? And so, Lord, as we partake of this, these communion elements, Lord, as we remember what Jesus said about take this and eat it, all of you. This is my body, which will be broken for you. And take this and drink it, all of you. This is my blood, which will be shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. And you said, do this and in remembrance of me. And Lord, we remember your sacrifice. We remember your love. We remember the promise of forgiveness. We remember. And Lord, we pray that, that in remembering, remembering your love, that Lord, we would be able, willing to lay aside those foolish things that have kept us from you and embrace those things that were meant to provide joy, peace, comfort, and assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake.